Thank you so much, Chair. Um, indeed, in the following uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we will try to cover a lot of ground, so it will be a little fast, although I will try to make it slower than usual. So we were talking about large-scale changes rather than small pilots. So this is one of the most major changes that was done in the healthcare system in Israel ever. That was the enactment of a national health insurance law in 1995. And it begins with the words you see in front of you that say that the, the law and the healthcare system are going to be based on three values, justice, equity, and solidarity. And that has a lot of bearing on everything that has changed in the system since. So first of all, it included a health insurance system that is both mandatory, full coverage for all, and free, regardless of whether or not you paid your taxes or paid your dues to the, uh, to the sick fund. The healthcare provision was to be given by one of four sick funds, and everybody had to be a member in at least one, in, in just one. These are non-for-profit organizations funded by the state through capitation, and what is interesting to see, there's very little move between those four health funds. People who are born in Khalid have most likely are going to spend the rest of their healthy lives and die within the system. That gives you a very good incentive to keep them healthy rather than to sell them services. It's very interesting to see that 90% are either happy or very happy with their sick funds, especially in Israel where people are happy about nothing. So this is really remarkable. Uh, you should see the marks for the um, um, politics. That would be an interesting number to show. Khalid, as I say, is the largest of those four sick funds, and it's unique in several aspects that I'll show you soon. Now, you heard here about the movement from community to hospitals. This was indeed what was done in Israel in the last 15 years. The case today, right now, you can see Israel in the very right hand point, I don't know if I can use the pointer here, but the very right, um, your left hand point, you can see Israel with 48% of the budget going to the community care. When we look at the OECD average is 33% and you can see here Germany with 30%. So this is a big difference. It did not start this way. This is the process that actually happened in Israel in the last 20 years. And you can see how the hospital uh, budget did not just stay the same. It was continuously and deliberately reduced as the community clinics and preventive care went up. And this is a very clear decision on what the priorities are in your health system. And this has meanings. This uh, really uh, makes a huge difference and hospitals are suffering. And the news is, is that they either they evolve or they cannot survive. Now, in terms of uh, going back to Khalid, as I said, it's the largest sick fund in Israel, um, and it covers more than half of the Israeli population, not a random half, more of the poor, more minorities, more of the elderly. In other words, the sicker population. All services are given under one roof. You have the hospitals, you have the community care, 1,500 clinics, and you have all ancillary services given under one roof. This is a great opportunity for integration, because at least in terms of structure, and the incentives, it's supposedly under one roof. However, if you've heard from Raphael, the fact that it's under one roof doesn't necessarily mean they like to work together or in an aligned way. What is unique also about this organization is that all the data is carefully collected electronically and being put in a single repository. 100% of the community care clinics and the specialists and all of that have a single EMR system, electronic medical record, record software that collects all of the clinical and demographic data and pours it into a single database. This database is ID tagged and there are privacy issues that we had to deal with and they are cross-setting and they are geocoded and you can use this to improve care, to assess how much you succeeded in what you've done and to allocate treatment according to your data. And I will show today, in the short time that I have, two case studies to show how this is, can actually be materialized and what's the impact of that. The first example, the first case study, has to do with disparities and disparity reduction. And we know that every health system health has disparities and every region has its own disparities beyond the health system between countries and within country. What we have chosen to do, we had we have a set of over 60 e-measures, electronically medical record driven quality measures, process measures, that assess how well we treat chronic diseases. 
diabetes control, blood pressure control, how we perform preventive services, and all of those electronic me measures, what we have found, we have t chosen seven of them that were the most disparate between rich and poor, between the uh, uh, best uh, or the higher achieving segments of society and low that were left behind. We created the composite score, we ranked our population, and we aimed to improve the care for 400,000 people, the lowest 10% of the population. This is not a pilot. This is a full-scale, nationwide emphasis on saying to the, um, to the landers, if you'd like, it's not enough to keep improving quality and improve averages. You need to in reduce variance in parallel. And that's a change of paradigm because they've never heard that before. And so we thought that by addressing 55 clinics, that, huge clinics that treat those 400,000 people, we can make a change for the entire system. And the, we thought that we do not know at the center what is the right thing to do. So this is top down. But what exactly needs to be done in every clinic? It depends on what they know about their population and what they think should be done. So we didn't tell them what to do. We told them where to go, where the, what they need to achieve, and we let the innovation come from below, from the grassroots. And they had amazing, amazing things done in cultural competency, in addressing the, the, clinic, the, the leaders within the community, outside of the um, health realm. A lot of local innovation with data and with, I would say, um, high touch instead of high tech. And indeed, within a matter of only three years, amazing change, changes have been witnessed. The gap in preventive services has been completely closed between the higher and the lower socioeconomical groups. By now, minorities and poorer people in Israel, at least in Klalit, have higher marks in terms of their preventive services as compared to the richer and the more affluent populations. In terms of the outcome measures that we have, that's very difficult to attain full closure of gaps. But we saw a 60% reduction in the gaps between those 400,000 people and the rest of the population within three years. And when we stopped intervening in those clinics and we said, okay, now let's see what happens if we turn off the Hawthorne effect. We turn off the, the, uh, uh, the, the view of those clinics, let's see what happens. And they didn't continue to um, close the gaps, but they didn't go back. So we are very optimistic. This is a change that will last. This is something much more uh, um, um, meaningful than just a local pilot. The second case study I'd like to uh, focus on has to do with readmissions. Now, readmissions are not necessarily a bad thing. As we know, some readmissions are necessary, some readmissions are good in terms of clinical terms, and some are unavoidable and are part of the clinical routine. However, there is a percentage of the readmissions that is avoidable, that is causing damage to the patients, that is a clear outcome of unintegrated care and of gaps, silos, that do not uh, communicate between them. And that is what we need to approach. So how do you know where to go? First, you need the data. And what we've done, we told each hospital first, we looked at each hospital, what was the rate of the readmissions? And you know, there are those who are doing well, and those who are doing less well, those with higher rates. But what's interesting is that this is every hospital looking at himself. Now, some of the readmissions do not happen to the same hospital. They were so happy with the care that they go elsewhere. Now, what happens if you reflect to them the entire view of the patient-centered data on what is the rate of readmissions? And lo and behold, some of those seemingly well-achieving hospitals were doing very poorly just didn't know it because they didn't have a complete patient-based view of the data on how well they were doing. And they were actually among the poorest uh, because the patients were coming to readmission just not in the same institute. So we have started a, um, a, a very uh, orchestrated program trying to improve integration and improve integrated care. When you thought there are three uh, pronged approach we need to take. We need to improve continuity of care. We need to improve continuity of communication between staff, and we need to improve continuity of data. I do not have time to touch upon each one of these, in, 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 um, but there's a lot of information about what was done in each one of those approaches. For instance, in terms of discharge planning, starting to plan where the patient is going to go and how he's going to uh, address the difficulties of discharge at the first day of admission. 
and the nursing staff actually begin planning the discharge at the very beginning with close communication with the staff at the patient's clinic in the community, and they exchange information uh, during the admission. Uh, continuity of communication, for instance, with uh, availability of an email direct uh, email correspondence or email-like correspondence that you don't need to find out who the patient care is in the community, it's already automatically linked. So you can easily find out data. And finally, continuity of data. And by now we have a system that allows the people, the, the caregivers in the community clinics, in the primary care clinics, see the discharge notes immediately as the patient is discharged. There's, a, there's, a, there's an automatic link that allows this to happen. And there's an interoperability system that allows um, additional information to be streamlined. Now, and all of the data, of course, goes into a central data warehouse. Now, I'd like to touch one a little uh, more sophisticated analytic approach that we are doing just to give you a taste of what can be done with this data. So one of the problems we have we can't tackle all of the elderly patients as they are admitted and given them the most advanced care coordination with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, care transition nurses. We have to pick our fights. And how do you do that? We have created, through all of this data, a predictive score that allows, even within the seemingly homogeneous elderly population, identify those at very high risk for 30-day readmission and those at very low risk for 30-day readmission. And this allows you to know when the patient is admitted to the ER and is or brought into uh, the, the inpatient, into the clinic, we already know what is the likelihood that he will come back when he will be discharged within 30 days. This allows you to, uh, to use your scarce resources judiciously and point them where they might have the most effect to the patients that are in most need and are the highest risk for lack of integration of care. Now, the fact of the matter, and again, this is not a pilot. Every nurse in Clalit, every one of the 40,000 staff uh, in the clinics that opens their computer in the morning sees a list of all their patients that have been discharged from any hospital in the country within the last 30 days, ranked by the risk of readmission. And they call them according to that list and they do the whole care transition measure and other processes that have been shown to be evidence-based in reducing readmission. And that actually brings about some results. And you've, you can see, I don't know if you can see the uh, uh, graphs over there, but it's going down. So um, getting closer to the end, this process of being able to harness research towards policy and then assess the impact is the learning cycle, learning system we're trying to do. All of this work is being done by the research institute that we started. It has epidemiologists, statisticians, scientists, clinicians, all working together to create those tools that would put, be put into practice. And indeed, this is just one example of what happens when you introduce such tools. And when we started in, two, in the middle of 2012, 35% of the population, as they were discharged, were not approached by their primary care clinic in any way within seven days of discharge. A year later, we are at a point in which it's almost 10%. So this is what, when those tools, this is the, the, the information technology is the, is, the, is the tail that wags the dog, basically. This can change, you can use it, you can harness it to make huge changes well beyond the pilots. All of this is being done in a very cost-conscious uh, environment, I would say. As you can see, in the years between 2000 and 2011, Israel had the lowest increase in expenditure, government expenditure on health, than any OECD country. Um, the, the numbers, as you can see here, are very far from the European region, and the starting point was much lower. So all of this is being done under austerity, and yet, you can see what happens to basic quality measures. This is control of diabetes. This is the hemoglobin A1C above nine going down uh, in this decade of, of basically uh, uh, reducing and continuously reducing resources. This is where we are in terms of hospitalization of diabetic patients. And you can see Israel there in the circle and the y-axis is the admission per 100,000 population. 
This is our um, cardiovascular disease mortality rates, and you can see what happens uh, and how co quality is being translated into mortality data into a point in which we have pretty good data as compared to other OECD countries. You can see Israel marked yellow over there. And finally, these are WHO data that show that in terms of non-communicable diseases mortality and premature deaths, uh, Israel is ranking among the 10 uh, leading countries despite those very low resources invested and they are continuing to keep on pressing down the, the costs. So I think in uh, Rafael Bengoa's uh, um, um, axis, we were in the no money, yes transformation phase. Uh, it's fairly traumatic, but it can be done even in that scenario. Thank you so much.